All right. Welcome back to the Lively Faith Podcast. It's me again, your host, the Reverend Nathan Stomberg, Rector of Holy Communion Anglican Church, and we've got Reverend Mark Galloway, Bishop Retired here, and Subdeacon Corey DuPont of St. Mary's. So we were just finishing up our conversation, a really good one, about our cultural differences when it comes to our, our generations, and then what that means for ministry and ministering to each of those generations and in Rhode Island and beyond. And I think there's one other thing, just given the time at which we're recording this podcast, that would be important for us to discuss, switching gears now, is the recent death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. I think a lot has been said, and certainly a lot more can be said, certainly never really enough about her life, her reign, her impact, and her significance to Western civilization. And so I'd like to just pick your brains about her passing and discuss what our thoughts are, because I think, again, it's it's a unique perspective coming from the great traditions and understanding how she fits in versus the plain, let's say, or limited perspective of of secular media, which really doesn't have any of that within its purview. So I think, well, whoever wants to go first, I'll, I'll let you speak because I, I think there's a lot to be said there, but maybe, maybe we'll start. I think one of the most striking aspects that was uh, even most apparent to uh, non-churched or unchristian people was the vast size of her funeral and not really just the size but the response to it that people were lining up for miles and miles to Mm -hmm. uh, view her lying in state Mm -hmm. that people were camping out to go see her and you're never going to I think see a funeral for anyone else get that same response ever again I don't think so the great, you know, the great soccer player Beckham was just out there for like 15 hours. It's unbelievable. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, right? Um, no, I don't think we'll ever see anything like this again. Um, everything about Elizabeth's life is utterly unique in the sense of its timing and history, the age she came to the throne the circumstances in which she came to the throne. But I think for Americans, uh, you know, uh, I, I spoke with Stellan Corey, I, I spoke at a, uh, last sat Sunday morning at a group of kind of like a libertarian Christian group of people about um, American religion and politics and how I had to uh, remind them a lot about facts, about American civics and so forth. I think this is true about Elizabeth too. Americans, you know, we we fought a, a war against England to be separate, and in the mythology, of course, George was this horrible person, right? He really wasn't. No. George, George was really... Ineffective, but... <laughs> yeah, apart from ineffective. Other parts, yeah. it was very uh, effective. Uh, of course, he had mental illness and all that stuff, but yeah. that's a whole different story. But Americans have this fascination with the monarchy, even though we're the greatest republic in world history, and. And they're our greatest ally, right? And we're really the daughter of the British Empire. So it's uh, always been this strange relationship in the sense of it, its historical connection. And so uh, with this tremendous affection for, for the Queen yeah. uh, in America, and especially over her long 70-year uh, reign. Um, I think what's really interesting for Cora, you and I, is that you and I would be aware of this, is that uh, Prince Philip was Orthodox. Yeah. Hmm. He was baptized in the Greek Orthodox Church. Um, you know, he, he went through the Anglican ritual to be uh, her, her husband and so forth, and he, he uh, you know, was an officer and, and a very effective one in the, in the, the Royal Navy and, and so forth and so on. 
But Elizabeth and Philip were people of faith. And, and, and those things, that play a central core in who they are. Mm. And that gets totally lost in people's uh, assessment of these things. Uh, I think you need, need to go back to Philip's funeral to understand Elizabeth's funeral. And, you know, it was under COVID, but uh, Corey and I talked about it. it. It was very moving, Philip's funeral. Yeah. And, and they, they built in the orthodox elements of of his faith in, into the Anglican funeral, you know, it's incredibly beautiful mm -hmm. when 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 they did that. And then out of honor, she did the same thing yeah. at her funeral. Wow, you know, that's love. Yeah, right? that's incredible respect and love. And um, I don't think we'll ever see anything like like this again. No, yeah. and and I'm not convinced necessarily that we should. Because when you look at at monarchy, generally speaking, it, it's a sacral institution. Yes. Right? It's, it's an inherently religious institution, whereas most of the world's modern politics are not religious, although they're treated religiously. Right. Um, I don't want to see secular politicians treated with the same measure right. of fanfare and no, devotion no. because it's an inappropriate understanding of what um, their function and role is. And it's also... A, a, it also bloats their already inflated egos. Yes. Right? Um, so a monarchist would look at it a bit differently. And we, we've had conversations over the years. I'm no big fan of democracy, um, or republicanism for that matter. Mm -hmm. um, the, the latter is a wonderful idea, but w without virtue, it doesn't work, um, particularly at a mass scale. So. And monarchy not, is not is by no means perfect, right? Historically, we know that, but it is the form of government I think throughout the history of Western civilization that's most um, amenable to the life of the church and Christianity, right? Yeah. Um, whereas and democracy that part. has not always been the case. Well, and it depends, so. and it depends on the type of monarchy, I guess, yes. is what I would say. And I think. Um, what you well for one um what you're saying ties back to what you were saying at the start of our conversation about um america's enlightenment roots and then the popular notion of separation of yeah. church and state for one and i think that has a lot to do with our current fascination with the british monarchy because we have no local notion of someone of of that separation between the head of state and the head of government and so i've i've heard i think it was stephen pinker or uh, stephen fry rather who described oh, yeah. the where if we had an american equivalent it would be like the president of the united states whole um going up to some guy dressed up as um uncle sam and going up and kissing his hand and getting his <coughs> permission to form a government where we don't we don't have those sorts of categories in our mind, and so that I think, in part, plays into that fascination. And even that isn't really a, the best analogy. No, it's not. Right? You just can't do it. Yeah, yeah. It just it yeah. wouldn't because really there's there's no place for it in right. the American system. Yeah. So to our I, detriment. So and I think that that plays into the fascination, but I think we need to emphasize the the totally Christian element, the totally Christian identity of the British monarchy. And that even goes back to, or at least it's evidenced in one of the things that I like is how Zadok the priest, mm -hmm. that song mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. Handel is played at the moment of coronation. And it, what it's meant played to the do, funeral too. and it plays yeah. at the funeral and it roots the, the office, the position of the king or queen of England in that long Christian tradition tracing all the way back to Nathaniel the prophet right. and David the king. Yes. Yeah, I, I th it's as often, I think, as a theologian and a historian, uh, I'm going to be a prophet of gloom here, <laughs> right? Is that Elizabeth reigns the last one that'll be um, based in the... the Solid notion, especially from her. She yes. had no doubt that her right was divine. 
and that she was a servant of God. She was anointed, as she understood it, by the Universal Church to be the monarch of the United Kingdom. Um, England's the last of any of the British monarchies that even bother with the coronation services, right? So it, it's, it's the last bastion. Whether Charles and William can pull it off, I, I don't know. Um, so in, England, but England is not a Christian nation, right? No. right? It's an utterly secular nation. America's far more Christian than England, or, of all of Europe. Uh, even with all of our decay and problems, yeah. we're overwhelmingly more Christian than anything in Europe, and church attendance and so forth and so on. Um, the Church of England is uh, feckless, to say the least, right? Um, there's 30 million baptized Anglicans and 600,000 of them go to church on a, uh, on a particular weekend. So there's, there's the reality yes. and the myth of what <clears throat> the role of the monarch is to the church and the relationship of the church to the state and so forth. But, f but focusing on Elizabeth herself, right. it's, she's a stunning um, connection re really back to William the Conqueror, right? <laughs> of a thousand years of, of this continuity of a Christian nation under a monarchy. Mm -hmm. And um, and and the most important thing being that it's Christian. Yes. I think the most powerful thing for me, I remember uh, Elizabeth wrote out every detail of this thing. And you know, when she laid in state, the cross was brought in. The cross was right next to her coffin the whole time making, she wanted to make it perfectly clear. She was a Christian queen, right? And I wonder if she's the last one that'll ever have a cross next to her. Yeah, mm. uh, it's quite likely. Right, yeah. and, um, but it's her life. It's what she stood for, you know, in that, in that incredible balance she had to be being neutral politically on the constitutional monarchy, which Americans think it's, and even misinformed historians think it's a relatively new thing. It's been it's it's been since the Glorious Revolution, yeah, sixteen eighty eight. Yeah. Right. right, it's been it's been <laughs> forever right. that it's been constitutional monarchy. It's her character that gave her moral authority. Right, yeah. right. And without character, you can have no moral authority. And the fact that she, you know, as people, and I think this is generally true, especially in anything major. She never took a misstep. No. Right. And she, she was a Christian mother, a Christian wife, uh, a, a, a Christian uh, influence over that country that brought this endless stability from the massive changes. Right? She was born in 1926. Yeah. Right? And through the Depression, through Nazism, through the war, uh, a daughter, father, who was a saintly man, it was a great king, right? Wasn't he supposed to be the king, right? right? She learned everything decent and, and everything about duty from that guy. Yeah. And, um, and I believe that's how she lived her life. She wanted her, proud to be wanted her father to be proud of her. Hmm. And that's how she died, wanted that to be her legacy. And I think it's that's what's going, it's a great meeting, I think, in heaven, yeah, won't yeah, it be? Yeah. And, the, and uh, of those two. And um, where would Western civilization be if she hadn't been the monarch for the last 70 years? Right. Uh, it wouldn't be where it is right now. You know, she's this vestige. She's um, just unique, you know. And yeah. That, for my whole life, she's been the queen, yeah. right? And. I think that's a... It's a stunning. Yeah, and I think that's such a large part of it for so many people is people all over are uh, feeling deep, deep sorrow over her death and, and mourning when perhaps they didn't even expect it. And they're feeling something that they can't even put words to. And I think it relates to that, that it, she 
was the cultural touchstone. Yeah, she I'm was a Bolshevik model right now. A link in the yeah, chain yeah. Of, of history. We talked about the passing of the greatest generation, and she is the, the, greatest, the greatest of the greatest. She's the exclamation point on this, I think, or that it's, it has passed it has, yeah. with, with her. Yeah. Yeah. We can deny all we want, but as we've said again and again, we, we are made for community and we are made to exist within tradition and because of her towering moral character she was able to serve as i think a sort of pillar for that people the world over even if they didn't realize it and i think <clears throat> with her with her passing it is now only being felt a sort of, you don't realize what you've got until it's gone. Yeah, she's a living body amid of goodness that we don't get in republics. We don't right. get in these, right? She could, because she's above the, she's above politics. She's also above the law, right? So I've, I've talked about many times. The, the queen could have murdered you not been arrested, right? She's above the law, right? But the fact that she lived above the law as such a moral person makes her even more remarkable, right? And, in many ways, Elizabeth's all that we should strive to be as, as Christians and as citizens of any uh, nation, right? That duty and moral character come first. Yes. Always. Mm -hmm. And who can we, else, can we really say that about? Right? I mean, we, we need heroes, we need saints, right. right? The church desperately seeks for them. Yes. So we even create some that really aren't necessarily that <laughs> that saintly, correct? Yeah. Oh yeah. And those of us as historians know that, right? And so uh, Elizabeth is truly a saintly person. Yeah. You know, in, you know uh, what we would develop in the, this particular version of the prayer book. We already it, this is over a decade ago. We said, you know, this person deserves recognition when the Lord calls her home because. Uh, her evidence, the evidence of her life has been so influential. And uh, um, well, One thing I'd like to share, too, I think is evidence of that. One of, one of my favorite speeches of hers was her very first Christmas broadcast that she did mm -hmm. in 1957. So I have the portion of the transcript with me. I'm just going to read it for our own contemplation because it's, again, it goes back to she was distinctly and unapologetically Christian, and I think aided by the fact that she was above the law and not beholden to elections or polls, that from a position of leadership, she was able to speak Christian truth and conviction clearly. And that also lends itself to being totally prescient about what the future could hold. So she had this to say in her very first address, which was the first to be broadcast over television. That's amazing. For one, yeah, just an incredible turning point in history there. That it is possible for some of you to see me today, and I'm not going to try and do her accent, <laughs> is just another example of the speed at which things are changing all around us. Because of these changes, I'm not surprised that many people feel lost and unable to decide what to hold on to and what to discard. Mm. How to take advantage of the new life without losing the best of the old. But it is not the new inventions which are the difficulty. The trouble is caused by unthinking people who carelessly throw away ageless ideals as if they were old and outworn machinery. I get goosebumps when I read that. Almost like scripture, isn't it? They would have religion thrown aside, morality and personal and public life made meaningless, honestly counted as foolishness and self-interest set up in the place of self-restraint. At this critical moment in our history, we will certainly lose the trust and respect of the world if we just abandon those fundamental principles which guided the men and women who built the greatness of this country and commonwealth. Today we need a special kind of courage, not the kind needed in battle, but a kind which makes us stand up for everything that we know is right, everything that is true and honest. We need the kind of courage that can withstand the subtle corruption of the cynics so that we can show the world that we are not afraid of the future. It has always been easy to hate and destroy. To build and to cherish is much more difficult. 
can even 1957. Right. And, and what what politician today would ever say anything? Even, uh, none of them. Approach it. None, none of them. them. None yeah. of them. Like right, left, center. None of them. Right. Yeah. And if they would, it would be just for yeah, that'd be the end of that political one. enhancement. Yeah. Right. Which wasn't even part of her agenda. Right. Right. Just um, the other thing that strikes me, and Corey, you and I have talked about it, right? We don't even have bishops in the three great traditions that even talk like this. No, no, no. Right? Yeah. And they're the successors to the apostles, mm. right? Um, but the queen did it constantly, yeah. right? Constantly through 70 years. She had, she had more gumption, she had more conviction than the guys in the mitres, and, um, which is pathetic, yeah. right? It, 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 it's pathetic, you know? Yeah. I always wonder for her, I mean, she obviously loved her country, right? She gave her life. She gave every ounce of herself selflessly to that country. And um, she also watched its demise. Right. And yeah, the end of the empire. Yeah. And, and, and just its, dem its moral demise, right. you know. And I've heard, I've read some critiques and you know, critics, you know, because she has the nominal title as the Supreme Governor of the Church of England, which is inherited from the first Elizabeth. Uh, the great, right? The two greats, uh, 1559, the Supreme Governor of the Church of England. But she didn't have veto power over uh, what became the disastrous synod of the Church of England, right? Um, so when, when, they, when they decide by plurality vote, as if the Church is a democracy, that abortion's a good thing, right? Or no fault divorce, or the ordination, what a nation of yeah. women. Uh, she did not have, she could not just veto that, right? That's yeah. not the role. Her role in the church is much like a role in the state, right? It, it, it's symbolic of being the head, but she's not, she's neutral. But I only can imagine how painful those decisions were for a woman who clung to the Orthodox gospel, mm -hmm. right? Um, and what other person, right? She, unless she was, you know, they incredibly ill, never did not go to church on a Sabbath, right? The ultimate example, right? The head of state going to bow down, and uh, I quoted this uh, in church right after she died, and I really was in tears saying it. You know, the, it was an interesting interview she had with somebody who used to work for her. And this person conveyed this after her death, and she was talking about her faith in Christ. And, she, and the person asked, it "Was a woman, <clears throat> if if you you know you were able to, to, if Christ were to come again in your lifetime, what would you do?" And she goes, "I would gladly just lay my crown at his feet." Wow, mm. oh, I like that. That's beautiful. Yeah, uh, sums it up, right? Yeah. I mean, here oh, she okay. is, the last great monarch on the wor in the world. Probably yeah. will be the last great monarch yeah. in the history of the world. Yeah. And she knew that her crown wasn't hers. It mm. the king. Yeah. yeah. And that's what made the fullness of her office great. Yeah. It's the, the dignity is fulfilled in the character of the person. Yeah sitting on the throne and not the other way around. Yeah. It's like it's like the office of the presidency. We've you know, we've been through this now since Watergate. Um, that the president's about the man. You know, it's about the office, right? And like with Elizabeth, she, she's the she's antithetical to so, so many of the presidents we've had <laughs> since yes. Watergate, right? Yeah. She knew it was all about the role, all about the office. Right? It wasn't about her. Right. It was about it never complain, never explain. Right, that's her motto. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very. We have very few heroes in our lives. Truly, you know, as we become old men, we realize we give up. You know, as Paul says, when we were a child, we thought like a child, we reasoned like a child. When we became an adult, we give up childish ways. But Elizabeth endures for me as a hero. Yeah. As a heroine. There's only a handful of them in my life as I approach my 
next decade, 60 years old, that I would put in that little bag, and she's one of them. Yeah. 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 Modern heroes are hard to come by. There's nothing, nothing childish about wanting a hero to look up no. to. And no. I think the absence of heroes is a, I don't know if it's maybe both a symptom and a cause for the turmoil we find ourselves in. She's the last Anglican hero. Oh, absolutely. Last Anglican saint, if you will. You know, like Charles the Martyr uh, for a generation was tr a literal saint. And, uh, yeah. But she, she's the last one. There's no, there's no ecclesiastical figure that can shine her pearly whites yeah. <laughs> shoes, you know. <laughs> That's it, sad, but it's true. Yeah. Right. And you know, and like we're seeing this with our Roman Catholic brethren, the faithful ones, right? You know, uh, <clears throat> you know, John Paul's his pontificate wasn't perfect, but his holiness was unquestionable, as was Benedict's. I lack the confidence that such would be the future of the, of the church, right? And uh, I don't see it at all in Anglican communion. And um, um, nowhere to be found, or especially n not in the global north. The next no, next great no. saint. You're right. I think that's will true come about from the, the global, global south. I, I think there's been very much apostolic men in the two thirds world for a, for quite a while. But um, and it, I think it uh, all ties together with our observance of. All Saints Sunday, where we read in Ecclesiasticus that we we read of and we celebrate the lives of great men in their generations, and it goes on to say, many of which whose names are no longer remembered, but they will not ever be forgotten. forgotten. Yeah. Mm. yeah, it's a great chapter forty-four. It's just yeah. Uh, yeah. One of my, you know, my, my favorite movie, Jerry Fire, yeah. st starts out reading Ecclesi. That's right. Chapter 44, and uh, let us praise famous men and their generations, and our fathers would be God us, you know. And um, yeah, it's um, the end of an era. The end of an era. Just, um, you know, people don't, the thing about her funeral. It wasn't required that you go pay your respects no. to the queen. That's what. Yeah. You know, it, 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 this is not this is not China. If right. The, if you know whoever the guy is, you know he croaked. They're all going to be made to line up and yeah. go right. It's completely involuntary. Like right. I said, you know these celebrities and sports figures. They like everybody else stayed in line for yeah. a day. J just just a bow to her Majesty. We'll see it again. No. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and in, and in every conceivable way, the UK has become a completely different society Absolutely. than what it was when she sent. Oh Trump. my gosh! Yes. Right. She, she was able to do that in the, the wake of the post-war idealism that you saw. Right, uh, you, you you were able to witness that within the growing conflict between East and West and the Cold War. Right, you had definitive you had definitive lines between what was right and wrong and, and good and evil. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, whether people like that or not, right? whereas now, today, it's very different, you know, not, not just in the UK, but throughout Western society as a whole. Right? Everything is fudged. Right? Everything is nihilistic. Everything yeah, is, is up in the air. Um, and that's, that's what Charles inherits. Now, whether or not he comes in and he bucks that, or whether he just becomes a part of it, I mean, I'm, Fairly cynical when it comes to, to Charles and uh, and William. We just, we just don't enough about him. He lives a fairly private life in comparison to the rest of his family. But um, I, I'm personally not very confident that, that Charles is going to keep up any of that momentum. Um, he seems to have all the wrong friends. Um, he doesn't have he doesn't have the, the conscience of his mother or his father, right? He right. doesn't. Which was steeped. Yeah. The Christian faith, right, and that's just not for him. I mean, he, you know, he he will, in some capacity, from time to time, pay tribute to that. Um, he likes to go on trips and he likes to visit monasteries yeah. and he likes to go to Mount Athos and all this stuff. But right, right. I, I don't know if he's going to necessarily come into right the position of king and maintain that because now he's he he's become accustomed already to using this this 
new title that they're throwing around, protector of faiths, oh, yeah. instead of protector yeah. or defender of, defender the, of faith, the faith, right? Yeah. Well, that's not a good indicator of no. anything, oh, right? Um, he just doesn't have the moral it's not even gravitas of his, of his mother. I mean, you no. know, this, no. the issues with his, his second marriage, the spurious demise of his previous wife. Right, right. It's right. just, he already comes with baggage, whether he likes it or not. Right. Right, so. Right. Yeah, I don't know. And the UK itself is, you know, I think most of the honest conservative commentators have already witnessed is it's, it's a doomed society. Right. Yeah, they, they, have, they have no replacement for the monarchy. You know, Where they all, place all, all this nonsense, you know, to get rid of the monarchy, become yeah. a public, you know. You don't even have a written constitution. Yeah. Well, they tried that already, and it didn't work. They got a 10-year tyranny for, on their own right. Cromwell, right? Mm -hmm. right. Forget that. <laughs> right. And they, and they don't understand. It's kind of a race out from history. Right. right. Yeah. And they, they, you know, the, it's interesting watching, you know, the, the anti-monarchists and the radical Republicans in the UK go on and on about why the monarchy is evil and so on and so forth. When um, there, there's so many other institutions in, in British society that have more power, more sway, all for the worst, than, than a constitutional monarch could ever really have in society. Right. Yeah. They, they behave as if somehow 1688 never happened. As right. if they're somehow living under the Stuarts still, <laughs> yeah. right? You yeah. know, right. it's like no, you're not, and and you need to get over that. Um, but but the problem is also is that you you don't have British politics is so fun to watch. I think it's always I think it sometimes it's more entertaining than American. Oh, wait, yeah, right? the parliamentary system. You don't have on the other side though anyone really pushing back at where's where's the Tory presence, right? Where's that exactly. strong conservative and, tra and traditional presence? Well, they're not there either. I mean, who can they put on? Yeah, there's no Tea Party in England. No, they no. don't have anything like that, right. you know? Right. Um, I mean, you get the, the Nigel Farage types who, who step up, but I'm not entirely, I'm not entirely impressed with some of those guys, right? I mean, these aren't necessarily traditionally minded people. I mean, you could push them at any of the hot button issues of traditionalism, and they'll probably take the more liberal line. Right. Yeah, it's really uh, so, it's really just reactionary and not yeah. there's no positive vision there. There's no first principles, right? There's exactly. nothing going back to that. Yeah, so none of those. Christians, those of us who are conservative, I don't think we can use that word even for this podcast, but faithful Orthodox Christians, you know, England just takes for granted in morality, right? Abortion is not an issue in England, right? Now it has has a moratorium how far it can go, which yeah. where America is going to get after Dobbs, right? Eventually we're going to get to 15 weeks. Yeah. It's going to take 10 years of of going through the system, and but Dobbs will be the baseline, and that's where we're going to get, right? All the states like Rhode Island un, un, uninhibited abortion. Yeah. It won't be the law 15 years from now in Rhode Island, right? Mm -hmm. But England's been just going along, and they did the same thing with sexuality, and mm -hmm. right? So their, their battles are utterly different than ours inside uh, the Congress, right? Where we're still fighting uh, about moral issues, yeah. right? And they, they really don't, no, no. It's about economic issues. Economics, so its relationship with Europe. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. EU mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Right. Which is fine, and there's a place right. for that too, that's serious, but they don't wrestle. But we're far more moral. We're, we're, we're far more, we're more moral oriented in our mm -hmm. political diatribe yeah. than they are in, in Britain. It, those are just settled facts, mm -hmm. right? Which would make us incredibly uncomfortable living there. Like, yeah. It's just like, oh, yeah. really? As Christians, we just like accept this? Yeah. There's, there's almost no pushback yeah. about any of this stuff, right? Yeah. So. Uh, again, the Americans, we've talked about it a thousand times, Corey. If you ask an American how a parliamentary system works, they wouldn't have a clue, right? Oh, it works like Congress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, no, no, just like that. Like no, it doesn't. Like well, the they, represent, they represent equal territories. No, they don't, <laughs> right? You know, the whole idea how you go find a seat in, Con or in, in Parliament. No, right. it just amazes me how Americans are just oblivious. I've heard it said many times, you know, is one, one thing that you will never hear in the UK is, 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 the, is the phrase that's so familiar to us as Americans, is that um, Parliament will make no law establishing. Right? right. No, it, that's not how the system works there. Right. It's how it works here. It, it does make laws establishing. It makes laws establishing all the time. Absolutely. And they make laws establishing some really insane stuff. Absolutely. Right? Because um, there's no Bill of Rights. That's right. It, it, there's a Bill of Rights, but it's not written. Right? It, it's, right. it's an unwritten tradition. So it's no Bill of Rights. That's right. So... 
Well, it's just like the, uh, you know, I always like listening to the, uh, it is entertaining as heck. It, you yeah. Know? yeah, yeah. You're like, that's not constitutional. I'm always going, there is no constitution. Yeah. It's in your mind, yeah. right? So how do you know when you're outside of a fictional constitution and inside of a fictional constitution? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, there's, you know there's, the Magna Carta's there. That's the closest thing to a constitution. That doesn't say a whole lot. No. That's relevant to, you know, No, yeah, 1215 political was a while ago, yeah. right? a yeah. long time yeah. ago. Yeah. Yeah. There's something <laughs> about even the, the coarseness of... Uh, dialogue in the House of Commons oh where yeah. just how raucous it gets but you know everyone's speaking their minds and yes. it's not it's not like it's, the U.S. Congress it's much where more it's honest called, in yeah, America it's so honest. It it's oh, very, way it's, more it's honest, so honest. Yeah. I wish I do wish we had more of that here absolutely yeah it's yeah. not all stagecraft and right. uh, smoke and, and mirrors people so. trying to give the best speeches of their lives yeah and, you know yeah and I, I think I think for us just pulling it back to what what our audience could pull, what we can learn from a perspective as everyday Christians is, well, one, understanding how good we really have it and having that perspective to help really feed our joy, which is rooted in Christ. And then the second is also remembering that we have a positive vision to put forth, which is the gospel first and foremost, and not a reactionary vision or just merely knee-jerk reactions to whatever the issue of the day is. And that is going to be our difference uh, as Christians and as local congregations going forward that will make us distinct. That is your point about Elizabeth. Yes. Right, is that Elizabeth said, and she did it subtly in every address, right? She only addressed the nation outside of those Christmas addresses like three or four times in yeah. 70 years, yeah. right? But her point is always this, if you're really listening, it's not the Tories or the Labour Party or whoever saves us, it's the gospel yes. that saves us. Exactly. You know, it's interesting when you, you mentioned that, um, the infrequency with which she actually went outside into the public and gave addresses. She was able to maintain more a sense of mystery to her, to her position than the, the post-war papacy has. Well, popes, are, popes are everywhere all the time. Now. Absolutely. It's mm. no mystery anymore to their position, right? And you would think, well, considering like, what they believe they about like the position, right, yeah. they would want to retain more of the mystery, but they don't. They put themselves out there all the time, and they're just, you know, they, they give stump speeches, right? Um, uh, absolutely. It's yeah. very strange, right? You wouldn't expect that, but that is, that is in a sense, what she did. It's a very interesting contrast. Right. So, yeah. Right, and, you know, and to to narrow it down even to a smaller scale, right? The, uh, the, the mystery and the moral authority that once encompassed the office of the Archbishop of Canterbury, right? Uh, outside of the papacy, you think about pre-Vatican II papacy, the most important, important Protestant voice in the world was the Archbishop of Canterbury. Mm -hmm. That was just like any other bumbling person yeah. in a mitre, just right. babbling on about global warming or whatever else yeah. uh, fits the media's fancy uh, yeah. at the day, right? Yeah. As opposed to being the father of the country, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, yeah, we're, we're desperate for leadership. We're mm -hmm. desperate for male, masculine male leadership. In the church, in the world, in the family, you know, uh, I when I spoke last week in this group, you know, and going on about I was telling you some of the, the ridiculous civic questions they were asking, and they said, well, see, they said, well, Bishop, what what's the most pressing issue facing the country? I go, the demise of the nuclear family. Mm -hmm. I said, easily. I said, and that that we we've killed 60 million babies in the last 50 years. I said, 18 yeah. percent. Of children grow up in a nuclear family. Yeah, it, it's unfathomable. See, it, it, it's unfathomable. And it's a, what can go wrong? Yeah. <laughs> what that, can go wrong? That's a point, though, that's going to be lost on a, on, a, on a predominantly libertarian audience. Because for the libertarian, it's not the family that's the most fundamental unit of society. It's the individual. Yeah, right. right? I agree. It's the individual. I agree. They just don't get it. And yeah. Which is why I've, I personally have never been able to go so far as to be a libertarian. Right. Um, and it's always been my own struggle with, with speaking with libertarians. Uh, well, you may have many things in common with that person, but ultimately they don't see society the same way that you do. No, because it's not right. a moral ethos, right? 
It's about the functionality of, of economic systems. Yeah, and, and, the, and the individual's relationship to the state. Right. Right. And it's, and it's largely negative. And I appreciate right. the skepticism at this point, historically speaking, but right. you can't save civilization without families. And, and the without, family is a, much, is a much greater buttress against the authority of the state than any individual is always ever going to be. Absolutely. Right. They, and they, I mentioned to them, you know, I said, uh, well, you're not going to like you're not going to like Washington. You're not going to like Adams. Right? Yeah. They make it perfectly clear. Yeah. Without the family and without God, a, a republic can't succeed. Because yeah. it, 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 it's a higher moral authority than the U.S. Constitution. Yeah. A law. A natural law. Natural law. And the rule of law. Right. 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 Which is immutable. Yeah. Right? And so, but everything around us is saying the, just the opposite. Right? Mm -hmm. We can't even decide if it's male and female. So you, you, you can't have order, you can't have law, you, you, you can't even have logic. Um, no, because everything just gets lost in this, this you know, morass of individual subjectivity. Right. right. Because it is the individual that creates reality. Right. This is where, we, this is where we're at now. So if, so if it's 18% in 2022, how, how many children will be born in a nuclear family in 10 years? Yeah. Eight percent, yeah, one in percent, one, certainly one in ten, right? So, one it's a I grew up in that situation, you did, you did, right? Your odds are less than his, his was less than mine, mm -hmm. right? Um, my parents aren't divorced, my grandparents aren't divorced, none of my siblings are divorced, right? That's off the charts, that's the most impossible, yeah, in today's culture, right? right. And, and as I keep growing older, I keep realizing I'm just an outlier. I'm an outlier in the church, I've been an outlier in the priesthood, outlier in his episcopate, outlier in society, we're outliers in the family, right? We're remnants. Yeah. And we are. The, the better we accept it, the more effective we'll be in transmitting truth back into the broken system. Yeah. Right, versus <clears throat> trying to recapture or rebuild some vision of the way things used to be. Right, which, which can't, is, can't happen. No, it can't. And show the value of being part of a remnant and not being a joiner, right? It's yeah, okay to be part say, of a remnant. Say that again because that is you so know, important. Is, is being part of a remnant and not being a joiner. Right. It's great right? value to that. And, and that's, why the, that's why so many of the churches in, in the Who the heck's States, not a joiner around us anymore, right? Right. I mean, everyone does it, whether it's in your profession, whether it's in a church, um, anywhere at this point. Um, if you're a teacher, the, the bureaucracy, the administration, everyone is joining. Mm -hmm. But, and they're not even joining things that, are, that, are, that, that have value or any sort of, of, of consistency. They're joining whatever is next. Right. It's such, yes. cow it's such cowardice, right? Yeah. And, and you see in this election, right, the way the election is breaking, it, it's, it's going to break conservative yeah. right, in this last two weeks, right? Which tells you that how cowardice that whatever segment of the population is, 20%, yeah. right? They, they really know what they believe. They're afraid to say what they believe. Right. Yeah. Right. Ugh. It's not good. What, it's not what a situation. horrific way to live your life. It's horrific. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, but it was interesting with that group, which were all libertarians. It was you know they were clearly either Republicans or libertarian types, but in half church, half unchurch. But you know, I said I just want to be upfront. You know, anybody here is worried. I go, I'm not even vaccinated, and they all stand up and start to clap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Right. And yet we just lived through two years when you couldn't even go to church. Right. Cowardice. Chicken yeah. cowardice failures. Like Jesus would do that. The right. apostles would have done that. Yeah. Like the early church would have survived persecution right. by like, acting like, like us. Christians have never risked oh supposedly yeah, risked their lives yep. before in history. And I think just to put a pin on that conversation, all of this rolls back up into the idea of a lively faith. Mm -hmm. Lively faith is a positive vision for the gospel. It's not reactionary, it's proactive. Yep. It's us going forth and doing the work God has given us to do. Right. We're all fide defensors. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So our time is about to wrap up here, and I'd like to finish on maybe a lighter note and just to get to know each other a little bit better too, let our audience get to know us a little bit. This episode will probably come up sometime around the Christmas season. 
And so I wanted to ask you both, what is your favorite part about the Christmas season? I mean, more personally, Jesus being born is the obvious answer. So beyond that. I have to say, and it, it, it's one of my greatest memories of growing up was, you, you know, the church would be decorated late mm-hmm. um, in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s. I just remember the beauty of the manger scene and all the greens would be around it and, and just... I didn't, I didn't comprehend as a little boy the power of the incarnation. But as you grow older, you know, in John 3.16, it's just throw, so thrown around as if it's just, you know, it loses its meaning. Yeah. God loved me enough he would come, become human to save me. Mm. I don't know why he would do that, you know, and... Uh, it's the greatest gift. Yeah. It's the greatest gift. The reality of the incarnation, which obviously he, he was born to die, uh, so it leads right to the cross, but God became human. It, it's just, I always try to wrap my head around that. Yeah. And I, I encountered that feeling, that idea for the first mm-hmm. time, preaching on the incarnation for the first time two years ago um, as a brand new rector. And one of the things that I was so struck by was just how raw and messy and insignificant yeah. Jesus' birth really was. We've so sterilized it, and we think of him as a porcelain baby on a mantle, but he was born in a, in a stable. It would have been cold. It would have been mm-hmm. probably totally dark and dank and... Heck, nowhere no, to go. Nowhere, no to, nowhere to go. No one no, cares no about money. them. No one, hardly nobody knows that they're there. Somebody trying to kill your kid. Yeah. yeah. And talk about, for all of the divine knowledge that Mary would have had, Joseph would have had, just thinking of human nature, how, how dark and hopeless things probably felt for them and how relatable that is and yet God entered in the midst of that mm-hmm. the ultimate the paradox of the king of all creation entering into creation at what could only be described as the most humble point the most humble way to enter right and yet the angels knew for us they? but the angels knew the yeah. angels knew yeah. Yeah. God's plan had been fulfilled and the devil couldn't win now. Yeah. 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 Just, yeah. Um, well, one, one thing that's definitely up there uh, from the theological aspect of one of my favorite parts about Christmas. I think, I think personally, too, I've always enjoyed the nostalgia around it, the sort of the sort of the traditions around Christmas serving as a touchstone. And I get a talker. It was a Volkswagen Tonka, and I got it three years in a row, six, seven, and eight. And that was it. Yeah. That, that, that was it. We got oranges in our stocking and all that, but you just... You well, know, that didn't matter. No. It, it was power. We, we went to Mass, midnight Mass, from the time I was six till I was 18. And um, it's all about that. It's all about family. It's all yeah. about Christ. It's all about going to Mass. But it just breaks my heart that that's not the center of my children's lives Mm -hmm. and my grandkids' lives. It's just, um, my grandparents lived 30 yards away. We all went as a family, you know, it's just, it's a lost thing, isn't it? Lost. It's so beautiful. It's such a beautiful thing. Yeah. How about you? Yeah. For, For me, I... There's the childhood nostalgia that comes with it. Um, you know, as I said earlier, their um, Christmases were always large when I was a kid. We usually got most things that we wanted, mm-hmm. you know, um, which was nice. But I mean, I guess in adulthood, I, I like 
I still I don't care about the, the commercialism of mm -hmm. any of it. I, I, I hate it. I, I me truly, too. truly hate it. It, it offends worst, me. It's the worst season of the year. It offends me. I don't like it. Um, well, one thing I do look forward to is definitely, you know, Christmas tree. I like that. I like going to get the Christmas tree. I like cutting it down. Um, I like dragging it with my kids. Yeah, 100% real tree all the yeah, way. Real tree, yeah, real tree, right? Mm. Um, they, yeah, they're messy and they're a pain in the neck, but it's worth it, right? Um, I like that. And... It, you know, and also be, you know, being Orthodox, and, and it's one of the few moments of the year I still enjoy Western hymnology. Hmm. Mm. No offense to my, <laughs> no, my I get Western yeah. Christian yeah. friends, right? Yeah. right. Um, there's a magic about it. Yes. Right? You, I, you, I, and I'll Hail start, the incarnate deity. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'll start listening to the music just after Thanksgiving. That's the only Same. Christmas thing I will do. I don't put stuff, I, but I, I look forward to listening to you know the King's College Choir mm -hmm. beginning to sing all the English plain chant, right, and all those beautiful old hymns, um, which I don't I don't get to hear that in church, right? right. Not that we don't also which have a, a Roman church now uses all of those. They don't use it at all, right? You know, right. so yeah. it's um, I don't get to hear those. You know, we have our own beautiful tradition by 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 sure, but um, yeah, but it's nice to be able to, to listen to that and you know yeah, yeah I like that yeah. That's yeah. something I look forward to. Yeah, the music, the 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 magic that is created by yeah the music is something that I yeah. remember fondly, and I always gravitate towards. And I I will admit I'm I'm a sucker for some of the older uh, secular music. I really enjoy like uh, <laughs> yeah. like Bing Bing Crosby. Throwing and, grammar off the train. Yeah, <laughs> 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 but really, again, more so for the. Uh, the nostalgia that yes. comes with it, and yeah. obviously there's there's no substance no, to no. the to the music itself, but it's about the oh, the mood yeah. that it evokes. It does the family. You think about the you know again the demise of culture. You know something like going my way or the bells of St Mary, mm. but going my way could never be made today. Right, right, with the moral message behind it and the yeah. power of it and everything. It either be offensive or it'd be just completely lost. Right, it's right. such a shame. Yeah. Right. Uh, because it's, 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 it's a it all life. points to faith. Yeah. It's yeah. all about yeah. faith, right? Yeah. Uh, even you know, it, the Episcopalians had to get their uh, two cents in the how they would write the bishop's wife. Oh right. Very right. classic. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, it's a typical feckless sermon at the end, right? <laughs> uh, but, but the point about it, it's still gets through, right, the, the main point of you know, the angel's a servant of God, ultimately, right? And uh, just the junk we get shoved down our throat. It's yeah. just, yeah. um, like you said, it just turns me on. I don't pay attention to any of it. <clears throat> don't, don't. Yeah. And channel, you, you, you got to struggle to channel it out. Yeah. yeah. It's everywhere. It's already everywhere now. I mean, oh, yeah. People I, I, putting stuff up. I was in the store yesterday. Ridiculous. It's all there. Ridiculous. Everything's there. It's not Halloween yet, right? Not even Halloween. Yeah. All Hallows Eve. Oh, right. like that means yeah. anything to anybody. Right. You know. They're all worried about All Souls Day, too, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. So, I see your bishop's wife. I will raise you the everlasting Christmas classic jingle all the way with Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> yeah. I don't even Corey know. Corey understands. I don't know what that is. If you know, you know. You know, you know. That's right. Must get that Turbo Man doll. Right. You got to get it. That's right. That's right. Christmas classic. Yep. Arnold. Well, gentlemen, it's it's been a great pleasure to yes, talk with you. I think I speak for all of us when I say this has been a great time, and I look forward to having more great conversations with you. There's no shortage of things for us to talk about. Well, thank you for this vision. Uh, I think yes. it's a great opportunity for me. I think I don't speak for my brother, but I think he feels the same way. Yes. You know, that um, we're, we're both. Uh, <laughs> we like to talk about God and theology. There isn't a lot yeah. of venues to do it anymore, yeah. and this is a yeah. uh, a grand opportunity for us to work with you so thank you for inviting us yes. and the pleasure is all mine and of course many thanks to our fearless producer yes, adam, adam who's thank you. Well been done. doing the hard work behind the scenes and the first man definitely couldn't happen <laughs> without him yes <laughs> yes well thanks again and we'll uh we look forward to talking to you again next time excellent very good thank very you nice.